speaker and um, also to the to the perks of having an, a virtual symposium because it actually allows you to invite speakers from the other side of the globe as well. Um, with that, uh, I welcome Heather Neef um, from New Zealand. She's a postdoctoral scientist at AJ Research in New Zealand and conducted her PhD research at the UBC in Vancouver. Her research focuses on the interlink between personality, emotions, and animal welfare, uh, mostly in cows and cattle. Uh, and with that, I'm very looking forward to your talk, Heather. Perfect, thanks so much. And yeah, good morning to everyone. And I don't know if there's anyone in the, in the audience that needs a good evening, but good evening if there is someone. <laughs> All right, one second. All right, everyone, screen looks okay? Looks good, thanks. Yeah, perfect. All right, so thanks so much for the introduction. Um, yeah, so uh, for their, today, I'll be presenting some of the work that um, I've been doing in the, the area of personality in, in dairy calves, dairy cows, and um, dairy goats, um, both while during my time um, at Ag Research here and then also from my, my PhD um, at the University of British Columbia. Um, and so I'll start off by um, talking about one of the most probably stressful um, events in the feeding environment of dairy calves. Um, and that's the weaning transition. Um, and so this is a time when, when the calves need to go from um, a primarily, well, entirely milk-based diet onto an entirely solid feed diet. Um, and so this transition requires them to completely relearn their feeding environment. They need to find a new food source, then they need to learn to eat it. Um, and so what this, um, this response to weaning most often looks like is um, what I'm showing here in this graph, um, where I'm showing the, the grain intake over time. Um, and so in this particular experiment, um, milk was, was fed at its full allowance until six weeks of age. And so grain intake typically is, is quite low during this time. Um, and then the, when milk is reduced, we see grain intake increases quite rapidly. And so this, this response here is um, usually typical of what we would see in, in a group of calves that are being weaned. But here is what is average for, for the group. Um, and what I find particularly interesting is if we actually overlay what each individual calf is doing. And we start to see a, um, quite a different story where there's a number of calves that really aren't at all close to the average. We see some calves are doing really well and then ones that are, are doing quite poorly. And so this kind of typical um, weaning program that's uh, one size fits all, so to speak, really isn't working, um, particularly for the ones that, that are taking to grain quite late. And so why is this, why do we see this type of variability? And these calves are all managed in the same environment, same social group, same nutritional environment. And so yet we see this variation. And so um, I was quite interested in trying to understand if there's um, some aspect to the personality of the animal that is contributing to this. And so um, before I continue on, I just like to give a definition for uh, animal personality. And this is most typically broadly defined in the literature as consistent individual differences in behavior. And this is consistent. These behaviors are consistent across time and across situations. Um, and so another aspect of, of this is a personality trait. And so this is a specific aspect of the animal's behavioral repertoire that's also consist that is consistent within the individual. And so the way that is most often that we measure personality 
uh, in calves, but also commonly in other farm animals is how they respond to situations that are novel. And so there's some examples here. Um, so we typically would have um, uh, a separate testing arena where the animals tested in a new environment with a new object or with a new human. Uh, and so what we do is we score how these animals respond in these situations. And so you can see here, we have two very different responses to the same situation. And so the calf on the left, uh, we would classify um, this calf as being a more fearful calf. And then the one on the right, obviously a, a more interactive and playful calf. And so uh, these tests, these same tests we did um, when they were quite young, as you can see in these videos, and then we retested them at three other time periods in their life. So we tested them um, after weaning, we tested them around puberty, and then we tested them um, after first lactation as adults. And so we were wanted to see how consistent they were from um, across this, this life period. And so what we found was that they were actually quite consistent, um, particularly from when they were, they were young calves to when they were adults. But we saw a, a change, an inconsistency at puberty. Uh, and so as you can see here, this kind of, um, this, these findings were picked up by a number of different news outlets. And they, they made this analogy to, to um, uh, human teenagers and how there can be mood changes, mood swings uh, during adolescence. Um, and, and that isn't, um, it's a good analogy. Um, and we do see um, similar findings in this kind of change around puberty um, in other animal species in the animal kingdom. So uh, really, really cool and reassuring to see this in, in dairy cattle. And it tells us that um, what we see when the calf is young is likely to be what we see them as adults. And so now that we know that these traits um, are consistent in, in these, these calves, and so we, we can be more confident to refer to them as a personality trait, um, what can they tell us about how these calves are going to behave and perform? Um, and I'm going to focus on, in this case, the first um, couple of weeks of their life in that, for that first calf rearing period. So um, in these tests, um, we identified a particular trait, one of them being exploration. And what we found was that this calves with this particular trait uh, were uh, more likely to find the grain sooner, they had higher intakes, and they ultimately um, had better weight gains. And what's really cool is that um, not only did we find that in this particular paper, we replicated that in a, a second study at EBC. Um, and then um, the work from Cheryl Costa's lab has also um, found some preliminary work showing that this is also um, a finding that exploratory calves do have um, greater weight gains. So it's really cool to see that this is a, a finding that we're seeing in several studies and in um, and different, different research labs. So uh, really reassuring and um, cool to see that this is something that we, we could uh, really be looking at to, to tell us about the calf's performance later on. And so from this, I think um, this is really hopefully getting us to think about that these, these typical weaning programs that really are designed for a one size fits all, um, we should be maybe rethinking this and thinking how we can individualize these feeding programs for calves. And so in a, a follow-up study, uh, we, we basically did an individualized feeding program where we allowed the calves to, to self-wean, so to speak. Um, and so what this meant was that we, uh, instead of just removing milk at a particular age, we waited until the calves showed that they were at least eating some grain and we removed a portion of milk as they met each of these targets until they completed weaning at 1.3 kilos of grain. And so we basically gave them um, up to 12 weeks to achieve this. Um, 
And so what we found was, um, again, a large variability in when calves achieved weaning. So weaning being based on eating this amount of grain. And so you can see we had um, a couple calves that just completely missed the mark, didn't didn't get that they <laughs> that they needed to wean. So part of that program, we did reduce the milk initially at the beginning, and that kind of gets gets them going on to eating grain. And these calves just did not respond to that that initial milk removal, and just continued to drink milk right to the end until we basically had to force wean them. And then on the other end of the spectrum, the calves in the green, they were the ones that generally um, uh, responded to this, this change in their feeding environment. They responded to that um, initial slight milk removal and uh, weaned within nine weeks. So, um, and so it's, it's these calves that are successfully responding to a change in their environment and responding appropriately that I think these characteristics of these calves would be really useful to identify from an early age. And so is there something particular that we can identify, a behavioral characteristic, um, something from the grain intake perhaps in the first, first few weeks that we could flag initially? And then we could use that to tailor our weaning programs. And so we um, did a, a series of, of, of tests to characterize these calves right from the moment they, they hit the ground. So their vitality at birth, um, their sucking and, and drinking ability in day one of life, we measured their learning ability, so how long it took for them to learn to drink on their own from the automated milk feeder. And then we did the series of personality tests that I, I uh, just mentioned. And so um, what we did was then we looked at to see how those characteristics um, related back to when they actually completed weaning. And one of the main findings we found was that those calves that were the slow, what we labeled the slow learners, the ones that took a long time to, to figure out the, the feeder. And when I say a long time, um, uh, one of the, the, the longest times was two weeks to learn to use this milk feeder. So that meant that every day, twice a day, we had to come and show the calf, here's the milk feeder, otherwise they wouldn't drink. Um, whereas on average, typically a calf would learn that in a couple days. Um, and so you can imagine from a practical perspective, a farmer really doesn't want to be showing up every day for two weeks to teach this calf, push it into the feeder and, and to learn. So, um, so there's something about these calves that actually we, we can learn very early on that they might also be delayed later on. And so these calves also had um, links with other types of behaviors. So they generally just didn't really come to the milk feeder, uh, weren't really interested in visiting, drinking, and didn't really come back actually after weaning, which is a behavior we typically see in calves. They really do come back to the feeder trying to get milk. And in general, they had generally low intake and um, lower weight gains. So kind of this is painting a picture of these calves that we might call them poor doers. Um, and the, the important thing and uh, the interesting thing is that we can actually, it appears we could flag these calves um, quite a bit earlier than when it actually comes to the time of weaning, when we start to realize, hey, they're actually falling behind. So we could do something about it much earlier on, I think. And so from this, uh, the learning speed uh, appeared to predict when they were able to wean, it had links with feeding behavior and performance in the calf rearing period. And so from this kind of group of work, I think it, it has us thinking, I hope it gets us thinking about, um, this is one particular challenge that the calves experience in their life and we already see that some calves struggle with it. And so I think it, it makes me wonder how do those calves cope down the line with other transitions that 
certainly happen to them on the farm. And what's, what, is there something we can do to help these calves um, early on to cope better with these, these stressful practices? And then on the other end of the spectrum, we see those calves that, as I said, are responding well to a change. They're finding a new food source when, when the environment is telling them it's time. And so do these calves also cope quickly and, and well in other situations? Uh, so as I uh, said in the uh, early at the top that I would be talking about two different species today. So I'll just switch, switch gears and um, talk to you a bit about how we've used personality to um, investigate feeding environments for goats. Um, and so here I'm just uh, contrasting kind of, or not contrasting, really showing the similarities between how we manage the feeding environment of cows and goats. Um, but what I'd like to, to point out here is that really in reality, goats are not small cows and the way that they're typically managed are as if they're, um, as if, as if they're cows. And so the way that they're fed here is um, fed from a low surface as in, in a grazing position. But if we look at the natural feeding environment of a goat, uh, what we see is that, of course, they are quite different from cows in the sense that they're uh, climbing trees to get to their to get to their feed. Uh, they're, they're at different feeding heights, really uh, trying to access their feed from a range of different heights. So they're classified as browsers as well as grazers. Uh, but yet we don't really offer those opportunities in, in commercial farm systems. Uh, so what uh, the question that we asked was whether we could provide this opportunity for goats by by elevating the feed bunk for them. And so we offered them these three different feeding heights. We asked them whichever one they wanted to feed from. Uh, and we were interested to see what um, their behavior and feed intake looked like at these different feeders. And so what we did find was that they, they did use the elevated feeders. And in fact, they did eat more from these elevated feeder heights. And then I think what's, what's really fascinating is looking specifically at the feeding time at these three different feeders and how variable um, the goats were and how much time they spent at the feeders uh, ranging from just 10 minutes all the way up to 40 minutes. And in particular, you can see that some goats are very consistent in the time that they spend at the three different heights. And then others are, are more variable. And I think that's an interesting finding in itself because you could potentially think of these three feeder heights as different feeding environments. And so how flexible uh, these, these goats are, are they changing their behavior because something's different about these different feeder heights. And so again, asking, well, what's, what's contributing to this variation? Um, and so we um, asked the question of whether personality would be we contributing to this behavior. And so uh, here I'm showing a situation where we, we basically created a competitive feeding environment. And that's a uh, reasonably common uh, on, on goat farms where you can see competition between goats to get to the feed bunk. And so here I'm gonna show you the, what, what you see in terms of this competition at the two feeders. And then also maybe take note of if there's particular individuals that you see um, consistently behaving a certain way. And so in general, you can probably note that the, the, the low feeder, the floor level feeder has a, quite a bit more competition going on, at least in the back. And then you might also notice that poor little goat number seven is at each of these feeders consistently the same goat that seems to be the loser that um, isn't able to get to the feeder. Um, so an example of, of looking at, okay, is there something about goat number seven that um, might explain what's going on here? 
or any one of the other goats that's consistently right up at the front. Um, and if personality can, can explain some of these competitive behaviors that are going on. Um, so again, a similar methodology to the calves, um, but we also added two other tests, um, more specifically fear tests, to look at their response to a sudden, uh, sudden sound and to uh, the presence of a dog or a predator response. And then from the behaviors in these tests, we, we identified these four traits. So uh, we had fearful, bold, exploratory, and attentive traits that we identified. And then what we, we did was we then looked to see if these traits could explain the variation we see in the competitive behaviors. And so one of those behaviors was feeding aggression. And what we found was that those, those fearful goats were more often the ones that completely avoided the situation altogether. So they were more likely to be the ones um, that were not at the feed bunk at all. And the bold goats, as you may have um, predicted, were the ones that tended to initiate the aggression. And then the attentive goats uh, were present in the situation, but they were more likely to receive the aggression, uh, but not necessarily deliver it. Um, so yeah, so, so this work kind of uh, gives, gives another example of how uh, a reminder that, that not all animals are responding similarly to a stressful situation, that they are responding differently, um, and this could have different consequences for, for the in individual. And so uh, I think hopefully it gets us to think about is there ways that we can adjust the feeding environment so that there's an opportunity for all of these animals to, to meet their needs and, and their preferences and, and how they'd like to feed. And so some of these um, examples I've given, I think hopefully has given a sense of, of that personality can really tell us quite a bit about the animal um, and that there's some really interesting, fascinating links to what simply understanding the personality of the animal can tell us about uh, a number of different things that um, I've just given uh, some examples here. And this is across the literature, so we can see some, many different aspects of performance, feeding behavior, uh, general daily behavior patterns um, across both meat and dairy animals, farm animals. So uh, I think there's a lot of potential here uh, to, to develop these ways to, to assess personality and that can help us inform how they might be doing down the line, how they might be doing currently, and ways that we can uh, manage these animals to these different personalities. And so, so far I've, I've presented the way that we personality test tends to be quite time consuming. It involves having a test arena, um, generally uh, 10 to 15 minutes per test to really get these very detailed responses to a particular situation. And that's really just not practical to do on a commercial farm if we are imagining to do this kind of on a larger scale, uh, whether it's for commercial farms to do themselves on their animals or welfare assessors to do. And so ways that we can, can really do this quickly and reliably. And so some of the work um, that we started at Ag Research in the pasture-based systems has been how we can do this on quickly on commercial farms. And so these three tests here, we, we did on 30 commercial farms around New Zealand and the tests were designed to be a maximum of 30 seconds. They didn't interrupt the milking flow um, and really required a, just a, a, a a period of time around milking that someone could do these tests. So, um, and we did find that these tests were related to the, the behavior patterns of, of the cows in the paddock and then also linked to milk production. So, and we did in another study look at um, a fourth test 
uh, reflecting the, the beef cattle literature restraining in a crush, but this just isn't really practical to do for a large number of cows without holding up, holding up the, the herd. So, uh, so that's why we went with these, these three. And so to give, um, just a, to finish up here, I think hopefully the, this has given some, some thoughts on how we can move forward and, and hopefully how we can be creative in, in tailoring farm management to, to individual personalities. And I don't have the answer right now, um, but I hope it kind of gets us thinking about what that could be and what it look like. So thank you so much. Um, and just some quick acknowledgements to all of my, my co-authors and, and funders, both at Ag Research and at UBC. So thank you so much. Thanks, Eva, for the for the great talk. Um, we have uh, approximately five minutes left uh, for two or three quick questions. I don't see raised hands by now. So I'm just uh, starting with, with uh, OK, Zhonglu, please. You can also go ahead if you have a question. But um, I just, I mean, just a great talk has a, how does, so you present like they have a personality. I just wonder how flexible it is. And you, you touched on that, how flexible it is with different system and how do we adjust you know, the, I mean, there's some, for example, farming systems that are quite uniform, like I'm thinking about poultry, but as you present the dairy system, for example, they vary a lot between countries, sorry. Uh, they vary a lot between countries and even within countries between farms, right? And so, yeah, how do you see it as adjusting the personality and how does it fit the system and, and matching those two, right? So one personality may be good in a system and not good in another system, right, for the farms? Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I see, I think I see what you mean. Um, yeah. And I, th I think, I mean, I don't know if I have the answer right now, but certainly I think with more work, we might realize that, yeah, certain um, personalities just aren't, um, I guess, uh, suited for what we're, what we ask of them to, to do. Um, and so, for instance, the, the example of the poor doers that, that I, I gave there, the question of whether, you know, is this a case of where we, um, yeah, is it, how do we adjust it so that these calves are able to fit? Are we fitting that animal to a system that is already there or do we need to completely, I guess, reevaluate how we yes, I mean this is, all, <laughs> this is always all discussion right do we fit the animal select the animal to yeah. fit the system or do we fit the system to the animal but also I guess I guess you ask a question on like your research is very interesting but do we need to assess personality in all those type of environment or can we expect that some results are translatable to other environments so yeah I guess it's also yeah. all generalizable and I think yeah absolutely and, you know how that the the animals already shaped by the by the environment that it's born into i think that we have an interaction of of obviously the genetics and the environment and so already if you're testing the animal on that particular farm it's already shaped by the environment that it's been in for that time um so yeah it's a yeah it's, it's a, a really interesting question so thanks <laughs> yeah, we have one minute left, Sandra. Uh, do we have a very, very quick question for Heather? Okay, I'll try. Um, <laughs> my, <laughs> sorry. Um, my question is uh, because um, in these uh, aggressive interactions, I, I see this point of personality playing a role in welfare and, and therefore welfare being highly individual. But uh, when it comes to aggression, uh, the welfare only of the losers is impaired, while my colleagues here have shown uh, a couple of years ago that the winners actually benefit in their welfare. So how, how do you have some thoughts on how to counterbalance this, that, that maybe like the winners might uh, be deprived of this positive experience if we create a situation where there's no competition? Mm. Um. <laughs> 
I guess my argument would be, I mean, sure, you might be, if, if, if we're saying that, that some aspect of this is rewarding for the aggressive individuals, but it's at the expense of another, I would probably still argue that something needs to change. And likely if we put them into a non-competitive situation, I'm not sh I don't think that the aggressive animals would now be unhappy. <laughs> I think there would still be some aspect of that, that there's a benefit for all of them. Um, and I guess that's, that's coming from, I guess, the, the perspective that we should be trying to make an environment that's the best for all of them. And if that's taking it away from, taking maybe something pleasurable away from one individual for the benefit of others, so that all of them have some level of pleasure then, yeah. But yeah, a really yeah, interesting way to think about it. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Well, thank you. Thank you again, Heather, for the excellent presentation. Uh, we're moving on to the next